Okay, well, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, warm welcome to everybody here this evening, and thank you very much for coming along. Uh, a special uh, warm welcome to our Civic Mayor of Torbay, Councillor Mandy Darling, and also to the consort uh, Lily Beckett and uh, Guide Dog Pepsi at the front here as well. Um, also, a, a warm welcome to our <coughs> local councillors, and, and of course, to all the rest of you as well. So thank you very much for coming along. Uh, and supporting this evening. So uh, my name is Glenn Gardner, I'm the project lead for the uh, Brixham Railway Heritage Trail, a uh, very exciting community project that we're working on very hard to bring uh, something new and something exciting uh, to the local areas. Essentially we're going to look at uh, a presentation by John Risden who will be telling the story of the Brixham branch line from its uh, initial setup um, right the way through to its running years and then its decline and finish um, back in the 80, uh, 1960s. Uh, we'll then have an interval for about 10 minutes where you can have the opportunity to buy some tea or coffee. Um, we also have a little gift shop just over the side there, small exhibition area just here as well. Um, and then we'll launch into part two, which will be myself talking about the uh, actual project and sort of taking you through our, our ideas and our vision for it. Um, uh, so that's generally the, uh, what we're going to be doing this evening. Uh, we'll then have a question and answer session after the presentation. So if you have any questions about what we're doing um, and indeed any thoughts and ideas, that's all welcomed as well. We then have a small presentation from the uh, Torbay Steam Fair afterwards. And then we hope to aim by about nine o'clock. All being well. So um, a few thank yous. Uh, first of all to our sponsors. So we have a number of sponsors and supporters that are on board with us, forgive the pun. Uh, so that's Lena Solutions who are helping us with our website and our social media activity. Healthy Footsteps who are helping to sponsor uh, the refreshments tonight for example and, and all the sort of printing bits and pieces. Uh, sign up, uh, Patrick's here tonight helping us with the uh, all our print uh, leaflets and flyers and all that kind of stuff and design. Brixham Heritage Museum, and Simon's here tonight to represent the Heritage Museum, uh, so, sort of um, supporting us with what we're doing as well. And then the local charity, Yes Brixham, also are helping us um, and are very keen to be involved with everything that we're doing as well. So um, I shouldn't forget to um, thank also Mr Adams, the head teacher of this school here at Furzham, and of course we've chosen this location especially because it's right next to the old, uh, to the train station, uh, to the railway station. <coughs> A uh, big thank you to John Risden for joining us this evening, for agreeing to talk uh, and tell us the story of the Brixham um, uh, Railway as well. And also, of course, to the communities of Brixham, uh, Churston and Gampton, the, the response we've had uh, to all our social media campaigns and to the general idea, the concept of this whole railway trail has been absolutely overwhelming. So it's been, been fantastic. Uh, and that also includes Chris Simmons down at the Queen's Arms, um, just down the road there for also um, supporting us with everything that we're doing as well. Um, and then finally, Churston Barony, who are the landowners of where much of the railway line actually passes through. They've been very supportive, uh, their agent, Strutton Parker as well, uh, as we continue to talk with them about uh, getting access uh, to the public to walk along essentially the farmland and uh, through the old railway track. So um, without any further ado, I'd like now to um, introduce John Risden to you to go through the presentation. Um, over to you, John. It's really strange for me being here this evening, and I feel really quite emotional about it because it is such a perfect place for me to come to to give this talk. Because 52 years ago, I started teaching here, my very first teaching job, and for incredibly happy years. And I look at you and I think, my goodness, haven't you all grown up well? <laughs> <laughs> and because of, as Glenn has said, the point of view of the, the railway and the schools been so, such a close relationship in so many ways, it is a perfect place to be. Now, this is somewhere I think you recognize. Somewhere that's been very special, certainly to me, all my life especially from the point of view that I was actually born here, back, back in the war, in fact. And it is the history of Brixham that we're here tonight to ready to celebrate. And when you look at that picture and you see people that we take for granted, really, in our history, 
down on the key here, we've got dear old Prince of Billy, Prince of, well, to, the Prince then to be King William III of Orange. And then up here, the church, the Reverend Francis Light, who would take responsibility for all saints, names that we all know and associate with Brixham. Tonight, we're going to be then thinking of another man, a man of great energy and foresight, who I think has been sadly so left off the history of, of our country. And I want to then start by really trying to introduce to you the reason that Richard Wollstone became such an important man for Brixham. And the fact that he, even following his death, was going to provide for Brixham an incredible expansion that was going to last for nearly a hundred years. We go back, to begin with, on the 18th of December, 1848, the railway arrived in Tor Bay. In fact, at the outskirts of Tor Bay, what we today call Tor Station. And this was the beginning of this incredible technical and communications revolution for the whole of this country. It had been designed and overseen its building by the great engineer of our country, Isambard Brunel, a name that we all know. But strangely, in a, a number of years' time, from 1848, a man of Brixham was also going to play an immensely important part in the, the, the whole concept of the railway. Now, with that arrival in 1848, that was the end of the line. And that's where it stayed for the time being. And it would be then into the mid-50s, the 1850s, that then there was a decision that really they wanted to now extend that railway. And if you were going to build a railway in those days, you didn't go to a government, you went to individuals to the landed gentry, basically, and industries of the country. And so, you had to raise that money. <laughs> the very top one is the fact of what was it that inspired people, the gentry, to actually buy the shares to create what was to be known as the Dartmouth and Torbay Steam Railway. The first was the fact there was a successful Brixham fishery. It was already renowned around the country. But it was hard to get that fish out and around the country. And now especially with this network of railways spreading like a spider's web, this company thought, right, if we can get the railway to Brixham, we're going to have a ready market there for uh, goods and also for passengers. Secondly, at this time, Paynton was a small town, come large village, centred around its beautiful parish church of St. John's. And really nothing existed towards the sea. A lot of it was simply saltwater marsh. And yet the Victorians, and amongst them a number of people from Paynton, had this extraordinary belief that they could turn this little town into a tourist attraction, a resort, a Victorian resort. And then thirdly, the renewal of Dartmouth as a port of the empire. 
During medieval times and Tudor times, Dartmouth had been the front line of trade for this country, especially the West Country, first with Europe and then swinging round then to the great Newfoundland cod fishery. And it had then fallen it would, into a demise. And those people now within this new railway industry thought if they could only get the railway to Dartmouth, then the port would just simply explode in being somewhere, somewhere purposeful and exceedingly profitable. And of course, that was the word that those people who were going to invest had to believe in. And they did. And so they were able to raise the money and start the work in January 1859, nearly 10 years later from when it had arrived at Tours. Now, during this time, a gentleman then by the name of Richard Woolston had moved into Brixham and built a house at Parkham. Parkham House. He was 30 years old in 1829 when he arrived here and he was a very successful solicitor but he was also a man of incredible energy and of foresight. So he then begins to put out his feelers to become involved in the town and in its wealth and helping to create its wealth. And one such activity would be he became a mine owner. And the mine that he would be interested on here was up at Tresum, right here, literally just on the other side of the green pretty well from where we are. Today we still have the open pit because it was an open cast mine and that would be producing limestone, for producing lime, ochre, and that ochre would be of course incredibly important. But ironically it would be his son in law, who was going to help to create this new extraordinary product. His son John was a chemist in Torquay and he knew what his father-in-law was doing with his open cast mine in producing the limestone and the ochre and because we were the fishery, the Brixham fishery, there were a number of products that could be created from ochre. But at the same time that this was happening, we had now a huge expansion in iron, in cast iron. And the one problem about cast iron, as compared to wrought iron, is that it rusts. And all around the empire, people were building beautiful structures from bridges to buildings to ships. But although this material was a wonderful material, this iron, this fact that it rusted was a major problem. And it's going to be right here in Brixham, thanks to Richard Woolston and his son-in-law, that they are going to create the very first rust-resistant paint ever made in the world, here. And that ochre coming from that open pit, he would then mix it with linseed oil and turpentine. And that mixture creates this extraordinary paint. Now, originally, they are producing it in a very small scale up here by the Wheel Prosper where there was a windmill, an old windmill. And from there, he then had a tramway which came across the little bit of the level land and then literally over the cliff. Now, you can see today exactly where it was. 
because it actually follows the line, or followed the line, of where today we've got Queen's Road, up just along Furzham Road. So you think, when next time you go along there, and look along that road, and think, it goes straight across, and then, whoomph, over. But that tramway was able to then take the first paint made up here at this windmill site down to ships moored here to be then taken away. And it was so successful that soon they couldn't cope. They needed a bigger site. And so it's then that they, or oh, Wollstone builds a new paint works. And that is what we see down here with the chimney down associated with what we call freshwater quarry today. Remember the quarry there wasn't at that time. So that is where now they're going to produce this huge quantity of paint. Now the amazing thing, it became so popular very quickly you could understand why. And Yet, it is so strange, because this man, dear Richard, he was a brilliant man in so many ways, and yet he never took out a patent on his new paint. It's quite extraordinary. And he was going to pay the price for that in a few years. But ironically, his main competitor was going to be another Brixham man. So, we've got that paint industry starting. Also, the Dartmouth and, Dartmouth and Torbay Railway, they start the building of it, and this is the opening of Brixham Road, what we today call Churston Station. This was the end of the line, and it was here opened on March 1861. The railway had got as far as here. And then this was the terminus for a while before now they continued the last leg down to what they hoped was going to be Dartmouth, but in fact ends up being Kingswear. That's another story. But what this does, though, they're now bypassing the town of Brixham. From here, from Brixham Road, you had to go in by horse or carriage or whatever. And dear old Richard... He did not like that. He wanted that railway into Brixham. And now he will turn all his energies to that. And the, the dear man, for all this brilliance, he wasn't actually very good at playing with money. He then floated a company. But before we, before we just go on into that, I want to just be able to take you on a very quick little journey. This railway line that is now going to be built by Woolston, the fact that it then shut back in, up into the 20th century in 1963. And this is a photograph I took when I was able to have a wonderful flight over Tor Bay. And I was astounded that from a few thousand feet up. There's no railway line there at all, but you can still see the line where it went. Even through the houses, when you get to Northfield Lane here, you can actually take it through and onto Furzham Green and right to where the station would be. It's as though there's a ghostly image of where that railway was. So, Richard floats a company, and here is the wonderful seal, the Torbay and Brixham Railway Company. And I'm very sad to say, and I feel guilty nearly as a blood son of the town, that nobody would buy his shares. Nobody actually wanted to support him. And the cost of that line to build this was going to be £40,000. And that's a lot of money in those days. But he was determined. His 
a sense of reality seems to have left him. And he began that work, and in fact it wasn't long before the bank was going to foreclose on him, and he'd become a bankrupt. And it was literally thanks to his son um, and John, his son-in-law, Arthur, that's the name of his son, who was a solicitor in Exeter, they t were able to take over the financial responsibility. The bank were happy that it be transferred to them. And in that way, Richard was able to continue with the building of the line. Well, this man, born in 1799, during the wars with Napoleon, just think of that, at that era, and his life, his wonderful life, until 1883. And the extraordinary thing, after all that he was going to do for, da for Brixham, he was going to die nearly a bankrupt. Quite extraordinary. But you have no fear, because in fact his son, his family were very close-knit, and he would be looked after when he then retired to Western Supermare. But whilst here, he would become the harbour and market, I can't even read it myself, the commissioner, proprietor of the Torbay Iron Paint Works that we've heard, and then this I love, Portuguese vice consul. <laughs> and if you look on an old map of this era, you can see the office for that consulate here in Brixham. Because of course there was so much trade with Portugal for fruit. <coughs> etc., especially. And now, founder, chairman of the Torbay and Brixham Railway Company. So, the work will start. The first sod cut on the 23rd of October, 1865. That's a year after the line opened to Kingsweir and the Port of Darkness. Two miles of track, which included eight bridges. Now, note, important. Brixham Station's 150 feet above sea level, and that's 40 feet lower than Churston. So you're going down to Brixham Station. Originally, there was thought of putting the line along the line of the new road. So literally, our main road. But the gradient for that was too great. That wasn't feasible. But they would have liked to have had the station actually down by the harbour. But that couldn't be done. And so it has to stay on the, the level that we have of our limestone, the plateau. So there's very little difference between in height. It's a relatively level line. Mr. Stewart was a resident engineer, and the formal opening was on the 1st of January, 1868. Now, if ever you want to read more detail of this wonderful story of Brixham, <coughs> The Brixham Branch by Chris Potts is a wonderful book. I'm just going to read you a couple of excerpts, but this first one, I love it. Absolutely wonderful. So I'll try and I do hope you will be able to hear me clearly. The day was a general holiday in Brixham, with shops and businesses closed, and flags and triumphal arches erected to celebrate the coming of the train. A special train hauled by a gaily decorated lance, a large 440 of Gucci's Corsair design, built in 1851 and left Newton about noon, arriving at Brixham Road at 12.40. Here the train was joined by Mr. Wollstone and guests and Mr. Seal Hayne the chairman of the Dartmouth and Torbay Railway, the officials of the South Devon Railway, and a band from Torquay, 
who were already on board. After Lance had run round the special, departure for Brixham took place shortly after 1 p.m. Probably this first trip was run at a sedate pace to allow the invited guests to see the engineering works that had been undertaken after passing through the village of Churston Ferrers, where flags were in evidence. Brixham was approached at about half past one, according to the local paper. As the train ran in, the band on board played See the Conquering Hero Comes, and everyone who could walk was at the station on this momentous day. As soon as a path could be cleared, Mr. Wollstone stepped off the train to tumultuous cheering and was led outside the station, where an exceedingly handsome and massive tea and coffee service, <laughs> costing £100 subscribed by the public, was presented to him by Lord Cheston. The latter congratulated him on his perseverance, in spite of the greatest difficulties, and notwithstanding every conceivable discouragement, and hoped that when, with this service upon your table, you are enjoying the quiet exhilaration, but not intoxicating cup, <laughs> applause and laughter, you will have the satisfaction of knowing that it was given with the sincere appropriation of your fellow townsmen. Now, after a suitable reply, Richard Wollstone joined a procession led by the band of the Brixham Artillery Volunteers to the town where a Wollston testimonial dinner was held in the assembly room shortly after 3 p.m. So it was quite a momentous time. Now, the actual opening for traffic would be a little bit later on the 28th of February, 1868. Extraordinarily, for those days, do you know what caused this delay? It was Victorian health and safety. <laughs> and somebody hadn't put the correct fence up along the edge of a parapet. So it wasn't able to run until that date. And 11 trains per day will run. Journey time, 10 minutes. And initially the line was worked by the South Devon Railway. Now, the word for them is not repeatable because the, the relationship with the South Devon was appalling. They were basically bloodsuckers. They wanted profit and they weren't prepared to invest anything in the Brixham line. And so it would be with relief that, in fact, then, just a couple of years later, they will then be thrown out by the transport board because of their illegalities, if it right. There we have Brixham that we all recognize, our lovely harbor. Now, as it was, and there, the station up on the hill, 160 odd feet above sea level. Now, when it was built, the school, this building wasn't there. That was a little bit later. The board school being built for all of Brixham use at that time. And then, June 1876, the Torbay and Brixham Railway gains independence from the South Devon Railway and is now again able to run itself and it is to be a profitable experience. And just look at the numbers of people who want to now experience this new revolutionary form of transport from first class, second class, third class, for just a third, 20,000 passengers in a six month period. And now for the very first time also, those people, and it was largely the family, 
who had bought the shares, there will now be a dividend. May 1877, a five shilling bonus to all shareholders. And I love this, a five guinea donation to the regatta. <laughs> Doesn't it make you think just how Brixham, our heritage, how we can bring it, we can squeeze it in, and how there are so many aspects of Brixham life which are something that we all can relate to, such as the regatta. 1878, the passenger numbers have gone up to 42,000. The fish that's been carried, over 1,000 tons, and other goods, over 2,000 tons, and parcels, 3,565. This is, in fact, the transfer of the railway to the Great Western. So now Brixham becomes part of the Great Western Railway, the whole covering the whole of the West Country to London. And here at the station, of course, where today we have the, uh, the station in, this was then Harris's Hotel, and part of the building was used by the Churston Golf Club as their clubhouse. And I love that picture with the ladies and gentlemen turning up in their carriages. Then the next date is going to be 1892, which is when standard gauge railway lines are to be introduced for the whole of the Great Western from what had been the broad gauge, Brunel's great love affair. And this extraordinary transfer from broad to standard over a weekend, literally. Broad gauge on a Friday night, and by Monday morning, they had converted the whole of the GWR from London down to Land's End into standard gauge. And there wasn't a single mobile phone in sight. <laughs> Steam trains, steam engines, need water to make steam. And one thing you didn't have up on Furzham Green or at Churston was ample water supply. So it would be again thanks to Richard Woolston down at Parkham, and it related back to the period when he simply had his mine, his ochre and iron mine, that he needed water for the processes for that. And he had a huge water wheel down at Parkham, and water was taken from the stream coming down the valley and pumped 170 feet up, which is an incredible endeavor in those days. And that water would now be here to fill the tank, which you can see so that the trains could fill up with water on a regular basis. Here, this lovely picture taken from Churston Bridge of the railway line. And of course, what we have is the main line to London, Exeter, etc., there going on down the hill. And then here, the Brixham branch going off to the right. And the memory for anybody of my age. It is still lingering there. And then today, this incredible conversion, of course, as Torbay as a whole has developed. So along that line, here we are, starting from Churston. And this is what is beautifully called, of course, the Brixham Whippet. And it was, it was like that, these little engines, and yet they gave that feeling of immense power and speed because of the, the size of them. And how we find the line today. Well, even this has changed since I, these photographs were taken. Now, this is a bridge road, and you can see then the line and its state then, and the bridge and all the vegetation that's grown up underneath it. And I know this is, of course, is going to be a massive job for all of the, your 
group to have to counter it, but well worthwhile. And you see, part of it here is a garden at that area, at that end. And onward, and then this is Elbury Bridge. So this is the train passing over the bridge, uh, taking you down to Elbury <coughs> Farm, that was once the only way down to Elbury Farm. And of course the bridge is there no longer. Along the line, this is along the Bascombe Road stretch where we are here with the vegetation as it is and you can just see Cheston Village there in the distance. And a number of photographs that I was given by a really dear friend of mine and David Fish, oh, yeah. who was the last resident tenant farmer at Churston Court Farm, and as well as being a farmer and a, 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 an archaeologist in many ways, he loved photographing trains. And he used to get in some of the most dangerous positions known <laughs> to get a good shot. And here it is coming thundering down and this wonderful man, dear old David, lots of t stories to talk, tell you about him, but only one I want to pick for tonight. He was in the RAF during the war, and this came from his own lips to me, so I know it's absolutely true, and it gives us a picture of the railway still at that time. When he came home on leave, he would have had the train come up to Churston Station, got on to the whippet and come down. And because the driver knew him, when he got to Elbury, to the bridge, there he'd stop <laughs> and let David get off because it was a quick, short cut to get down to the farm. And you see, this happened all the time. There's no doubt about it. And then to the village and that lovely bridge that still remains at the end of the high street, that we see today and now we have that stretch from the village up to what these days is Copythorne but back in the days of the railway it was still Bascom Road all the way into Brixham and of course goods trains as well as passenger trains and the state of the line in this section between the village and Bascom Bridge, as you see it here. And just one little other f aspect of it, which I always fascinates me. In this field, during the Second World War, when the Americans arrived, there was a black engineering regiment situated there. And of course, it was back in the days when you had them white and black kept well apart. But those black soldiers, ironically, they were the men who actually modernized and prepared Key Lane up to changing it into what a lot of people call America Lane today. That's putting down the surfacing so that Sherman tanks and large trucks could drive right the way down to Brixham. And that's where they were encamped. And the young lady, Wendy, who was at school at, at, in Churston at that time, lovely lady who I know well today still, and she had a wonderful picture taken of her at the farm on a, her lovely white horse with a black soldier holding that horse, holding the reins. And then at Bascom Bridge here, now this sometimes surprises people, that upright pipe, that's a vent pipe from the main sewage pipe that runs all the way from Torquay round the bay to go out under Berry Head. And these were put in back in the 1970s. And then as we look to our left, as we're coming along Bascom Road, having come over the bridge, this is what its nickname had become, the Prairie. 
And you see, it is rather like a prairie, that this sort of open, flat area. Two members of the railway staff, the engine driver and fireman, who were apprehended for having stopped the train somewhere along here and nicked somebody's spuds <laughs> from, from an allotment. Because, of course, all along the line, you had the allotments. And uh, it was very easy to quickly, nobody's looking, we'll just stop and uh, take that in. And as we see the prairie today, and all waiting for you to get to work. <laughs> I think this is going to be your first area, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And there's Northfield, now the new Northfield Road, you see there. The stations. Those lovely gleaming carriages with their running boards. And 1887, Edward George Tripp, station master, salary 100 pounds. Mind you, that's a reasonable amount of money in those days. And a very quick little piece, not as long as the other one, of the station. Twenty third of July, eighteen eighty, edition of the Dartmouth Chronicle. There was a report that William Bluebeard had broken into Brixham Station overnight, Wednesday, ransacked the booking office, but took nothing. He also broke into the refreshment room, where he stole some coppers, two pounds of biscuits, some cigars, and some sponge cakes and drank some brandy, whiskey, and beer. He was apprehended rolling drunk. <laughs> At 2 p.m. next day. There. So you never knew what was going to be happening. This is a picture I love showing Overgang Road coming up and that lovely, literally, hairpin there. And of course, this is the road on the Black Ball Lane coming down. There's the chimney of the factory, Wollstone's factory. And taking you up to the station. And then this photograph is, is unique, I think, within the railway system of the country. Literally up there, 200 feet nearly up above the sea, looking straight down into the open, the outer harbour. because you can't see it. Well, the, the writing mentions here a particular day in the 1800s when shunting was taking place to actually take a fish wagon and attach it to a train. And the engine driver was a little bit too uh, encouraging and he hit the wagon too hard and it literally went over the buffers. <laughs> so it goes over the buffers and crashes down to this spot here. And luckily, nobody was standing there at the time, <laughs> else you would have been flattened, obviously. And of course, now, where those sidings, etc., were, now that little housing estate. The harbour, then, 1937, the GWR dredge out three and a half thousand cubic yards of mud from the inner harbour because for the railway, the fishery is a vital ingredient. So working together. And then these lovely, fascinating maps of Brixham at that time, which again, you need time to look at. But can I recommend you do? They are so interesting from the gasometers to all other aspects of the railway line itself and photographs of just the same area. 1934, for the first time, motorised transport takes over from horse-drawn wagons to bring the fish up from the harbour, from the quayside, up to the station. And then as we come into this era, <coughs> oil bunkering 
which would be so incredibly vital during the war. Now, are you going to show? Yes, I did it red. 1917, the year after the breakwater had been completed, we have an oil facility at the head of the, break, of the breakwater here, where we can see it very clearly. So there's two of them that were built there, 1917 and 1922. And of course today, one is used as a car park. And you can still see the cylindrical shape of it. And then 1936, and this is one time we actually got it right, in looking ahead and realizing Hitler was going to be a threat. And so we have these five big aviation spirit tanks buried under Berry Head, this, this rear end of Berry Head. And you can still see the, uh, the fencing yeah. with the barbed wire that shows that area where they were. Now this is quite extraordinary. Then from here, Northfield Oil Depot, and what you then have is a pipeline leading from there around the shore, then across the inner harbour and up to Northfield's oil depot. And we have, luckily I managed to find this little old map of that era before all the rest of the development had been done. But you can see that little bit of line left there. And then you can see where the storage tanks were here. And every night they would reverse in a train of tanker wagons at night and this is after Dunkirk when the channel ports Dover was impossible for having oil tankers going up they would just have simply been obliterated so now the oil tankers especially of this high octane fuel which is incredibly inflammable we brought into Brixham offloaded into those tanks on Berry Head, and then these trains coming in at night, loading up, and then making that journey up to the south of England, to the airfields, the airdromes, the fighter airdromes around London, etc. And so Brixham was playing an incredibly important strategic role in the defense of our country at that time, right here, not a gun, but actually in fueling, keeping the aircraft going. And so at the end of the war, then we have the arrival of nationalization. And here we have a train. The number of trains, though, goes up as the years go by. It's quite extraordinary. We went up to... was something like 24 trains a day. Yeah. And of course, now following the end of the war, bit by bit, first the fishery is going to be coming back, the cooperative being created, but also tourism and those lovely holiday camps that were then developed up around Berry Head <coughs> area. And this picture here denotes a time when this conflict of transport now, because motor cars are becoming more popular, buses are coming into being to compete with the railway. And this picture is on the day of a bus strike when they had the biggest number. And that was Saturday, the 27th of July, 1957. And you have here now, now they didn't call them carriages, they called them trailers, which I find fascinating. But this is another wonderful name. You've got here an auto sandwich. Because the auto is because the person who is controlling the train, the driver, is actually there. And the fireman is tending to keeping the engine going. And you see the engine is sandwiched by carriages or trailers on either side. 
So it's an auto sandwich. Another one here where you have the trailers and then here you've got a fish wagon. And it must be wonderful when you're driving the engine, having that visibility. I think God help you if you stepped out in front of the, lot, the drain on the open line. But they obviously had to be very aware. And then photographs that I know Glenn has got here as well. This wonderful picture, I think for us it shrieks out so much. This is Brixham Station staff celebrating the retirement of Cecil Williams, September 1949, who was a station master. But it's a fact of how many people do you see on a railway station today <laughs> when a train goes through? And look at the number. It, I, I just stretch my head in disbelief as to what we're now all doing. Are we all in Sainsbury's <laughs> working there? I, just extraordinary. And so we come nearly to the end of the story, to our conclusion. And it will be the last passenger train, Saturday the 11th of May, 1963. And we're left with these fascinating little reminders of our lovely railway that was here, and of Richard Wollstone, who we have to thank for it. And that lovely bridge. And just by it, the Queen's, now, in fact, when Wollstone put the water supply through from Parkham, right at the beginning, before the railway had even been created, the Queen's was there, and they were allowed to have water from Mr. Wollstone. And the, the grand finale would be this irony. Well, I suppose it's introducing us, really, into being part of this great tourist world that we are. Not the fishery, but the tourist world. And the filming of this very shocking ex-certificate film called The System, September 1963. And I'm proud to be able to tell you I was an extra. <laughs> we, had a, we had to do a down at Elbury Cove the, the finale of the film, and it was quite something, I must admit. And Oliver Reed, I don't really remember him, that, except that he was quite a character in more ways than one. But there, the last use of Brixham Station. And for me, coming along in 1973, now where the railway line had been, that is to disappear. And it is now the children's playground where we used to be standing to make sure the children weren't going to be hurting themselves. And that's my memory, you see, of Furzum at that time for most of my life. And what are we left with in the town? Well, the bridges and then always that memory, that plate name on the hill, Station Hill. There once was a railway. And that railway was created by an incredible man for which we should be so grateful. And my sincere thanks to Chris Potts, whose book I have and use regularly, and I recommend to you, to David Fish, a great friend, and in memory of the Brixham branch. And I know Richard Wollstone, will be saying good on you, wishing you every success in your efforts now with the, the pathway. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. John, thank you very much. That was a really, really Um, what we're going to do now is uh, just introduce the uh, Brixham Heritage Railway Trail uh, project team. So I'd just like to invite to come to the front. Um, we've got George Coles, we've got Pauline Elliott, 
James Nightingale, Les Morris, and Carlton Jones. So these guys are all uh, doing a fantastic job with supporting the whole project. Uh, we have another two members who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight. That's Mark Sanders and Mark Waters. Um, but between the team, we're kind of spreading the load, as you might, might imagine from a, a volunteer point of view, um, over and above our day jobs and other bits and pieces, there's a, a tremendous amount of work to be done. So these guys are helping me and the team to really sort of spread the load and are doing a great job. So thank you to all you guys for your support. Thank you very much. Let's take a seat. You'll, no, you'll notice also on the flyer that we have, um, there's a painting on the front there by Mike Jeffries, um, who is it's a wonderful picture or a wonderful painting of the railway. And we've been allowed to use that officially by um, Mike's uh, wife, Penny Arbatella. Um, so we're, all, we're doing everything properly. We're getting all the proper permissions. Um, and it's a wonderful color image, we think, of that. The only painting that we know about of the Brixham Railway, actually. So. Um, Okay, so let's let's uh, continue on. So um, we've done that bit, and there it is. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I think what we'll do now is we'll just run through um, a quick uh, piece here of what I'm going to cover during the next sort of 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to cover the background to the project, the concept, or well, the idea of what what it's all about, the progress so far, how we've uh, how we how we're getting on with it all, um, the engagement with the landowners and the various key stakeholders. Um, also the uh, community engagement and the tremendous response that we've had, the, ro the route of the trail, which I'm sure you'll be very keen to know more about, uh, and the points of interest along the trail, the hurdles and how we've tackled them, which there's been a few, funding, risks to the project, and how you guys can get involved as well. <clears throat> so a little bit of background for you. So I was born and raised in Brixham, um, and my wife and my two boys moved back to Brixham just last year in March. Uh, during lockdown, um, but it's great to be back in the town. And uh, I was just out exploring one evening in August on my bike, sort of rediscovering my, my, my childhood, I suppose, and re-familiarising my, re myself with Brixham. And I found myself up on Furzham. Now, I'm from higher Brixham, not from Furzham, and I didn't really ever know much about the railway or indeed where the railway station actually was located. So I was up there and I thought, well, I'll put it out on Facebook and see if anybody can tell me exactly where the site was. And boy, did they. Um, yeah, I had a tremendous response saying, well, it's obviously up where uh, Rope Walk Hill is and uh, Harbour View Close is now uh, where the housing estate is. So um, it's not that obvious, I don't think, to people that don't know. So, uh, so that was an education via Facebook, which was great. January of this year, I linked up with Carlton Jones, one of the project team members, who had previously taken an interest in doing something about bringing back online to give the, uh, um, the railway. And then uh, we thought, well, I came to discover that actually in May of 1963, <clears throat> so 60 years um, next May, it, of course, will be the 60th anniversary of the closure of the Brixham branch line. So I thought, oh, you know, maybe we could do something there um, to commemorate or to mark the occasion uh, of the closing of the line, but also the rebirth of the opening of the line in some way. Um, and so we thought, let's launch the project a year before that with the aim of hopefully getting um, the project up and running properly by the anniversary or doing something for the anniversary, the 60th anniversary of the closure. So we did that. Uh, we had tremendous media coverage. Um, and then, you know, from June right through to now, uh, we've had some fantastic support and lots and lots of interest from the local communities in Brixham, but also Churston and Gampton and beyond as well. So it's been tremendous. Here's a little bit of the press coverage uh, that we've had. As you can see, we've been in the English Riviera magazine. We've been on the radios, Herald Express, Torbay Weekly, and the Brixham uh, Signal as well. Funny enough, quite, quite appropriate, we thought, that one. So um, that has helped us reach people who aren't on Facebook, because not everybody's on Facebook. We do a lot of social media activity through Facebook. We have a website as well. Um, but this outreach has been great, because we've had people phoning me quite regularly with all sorts of stories and telling me um, their memories of the, uh, of the railway, the Brixham branch line. So it's been a great response to that press activity. So the concept and the idea. Really, as I said, I was looking at what we can maybe do for the 60th anniversary, and I kind of thought, well, you know, looking around, there is nothing to tell you around Furzham anything about the railway, the Brixham branch line, apart from a couple of little clues, like the railway bridge that John talked about earlier, just over here. 
Um, maybe if you know where the signal station, the signal box was located, just behind the school here, um, and a couple of other smaller clues, but clues, but nothing really very obvious. So I thought, not even an information board up on the station site. You have information boards around other parts of the town, including actually down at uh, Freshwater Quarry, where the paintworks were, uh, Wollstone's paintworks. There's an information board telling the wonderful story all about that. But the railway outside of the museum, Brixham Heritage Museum, there's nothing to tell you anything at all. So I thought, well, let's um, you know, see if we can do something about that. Maybe an information board would be nice for the 60th anniversary. But then actually, quite a lot of the railway is still there, the track bed, mostly from North, Bound North Boundary Road right the way through to Bridge Road. It's pretty much intact, hasn't been touched really over the last nearly 60 years. So we uh, I kind of got thinking, well, perhaps we could actually look to open up the railway as a walk, walking route or a cycle route or something like that. So, um, yeah, we thought that would be a great idea to bring the communities of Brixham, Cherston and Gampton together and have a nice, safe, designated walking route between Brixham and Cherston. Because let's face it, if you're walking or cycling between the two places, it could be quite precarious whether you go the main road or even the back road where park cars are bombing down Bascom Road. It can be quite dangerous. Um, so that's the general idea is let's see what we can do. Let's talk to the landowners. Let's talk to the key stakeholders and see if we can open up the trail as a walking, as a walking route, um, but with some history added in and maybe some uh, a nature trail section as well. So um, our progress so far is really the running order there. Um, we've been really encouraged by the tremendous support and interest that we've had from the local community. People have talked about opening up the railway line over the years. Um, People have been talking about maybe getting the trains running back on the line again. Of course, unfortunately, you can't do that because they've built houses at both ends, uh, both in this area, right along here in Furzham, and also a little bit over in the Churston area as well. So you could never bring back the line as it was unless you knock down all those houses, which is not going to happen. So um, we've been doing a lot of work in our spare time, sometimes not in our spare time, um, because of the sort of the passion and enthusiasm that we have as a team for this. So we've been uh, researching a lot, and some of our team members, particularly Pauline, has been doing lots of research into the people that worked on the railway. Uh, and we have a tremendous amount of information about that as well. We've been able to establish what remains of the old branch line, um, the infrastructure and the historical items that are right the way along the old branch line. I'll go into a bit more of that as we go along the, the, the track literally in a minute. Um, we've put together a project plan, a very detailed project plan, which I have a, a copy of here. And um, the reason we've put that together so comprehensively is to provide to the Churston Barony via their land agents um, to say, look, would it be feasible, would it be even possible to allow us to use the land um, through the farm, essentially, where the track bed of the railway is today, uh, to allow the public to go through that? The response from them actually has been very favourable and very warm, so we're very, very encouraged by that. I don't know if they've ever been approached about having people walk along uh, the old track bed before now. Um, we're also talking to other key stakeholders about the bridges and access over and under them as well because there's different ownership and of course private land owners as well. So, um, so we put together the, the, um, the project plan which covers I'm pretty sure everything that we need to cover in it. We've also formed, uh, as I said, the multi-talented volunteer project group, everybody bringing in different strengths and uh, experiences. Uh, we've created a Facebook page that we uh, quite regularly update and put new content out, whether that be photos, video, information, little nuggets of uh, facts and, and bits and pieces like that. Uh, we even have our own YouTube channel. So as I said at the beginning, we're going to, uh, this is being recorded today, so this will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So you can uh, review that back. And I know there were people that wanted to come here today but couldn't, so they will be watching, I'm sure, when that goes live. Um, we've also been engaging with local community groups, uh, talked about Yes Brixham earlier and various others, and we've been reaching out to the community to find out about, you know, do you have any photographs, any memorabilia, items of interest, um, anything really that relates to the Brixham branch line, because um, Brixham Museum have a lovely little exhibition down there, and I'd recommend if you haven't been down to the museum to see it, to go and see it, but it's it's quite tired, so the idea for the 60th anniversary is to bring together as much as we can, and some of it is here uh, on my right here uh, as well, but there are 
all sorts of bits and pieces. We've had luggage labels, ticket stubs. We've had uh, the Great Western Railway notice sign here, um, which weighs a ton. It's the proper iron version. Um, and all sorts of things that we want to bring together to create a lovely new exhibition ready for the 60th anniversary next year down at the museum. But the other side of it also is about getting memories and uh, people hearing people's stories about the railway and their memories of it. And uh, we've been having lots of stories um, come through to us as well. So I'll tell you a bit more about that later. Um, and obviously to establish the actual trail itself as well. So, um, so touching on the engagement with the landowners, uh, so there are kind of four main landowners um, that we are li liaising with. And those include, of course, as I mentioned, the Churston Barony, so that's Lord Churston's estate, um, which uh, they own much of the land between Brixham and Churston, the farm and other areas of, as well. Uh, and of course, the branch line, the track bed that's still there today that you saw in the photograph earlier, runs right the way through from North Boundary Road all the way through to Bridge Road, uh, all in their territory. So uh, it's important that we keep our dialogue going with them via their land agent, Strutton Parker, and we are encouraged with everything that we are uh, talking about with them. Uh, Torbay Council, of course, or TDA, in regards to permissions, planning permissions, and also having um, areas like sort of the pathways in the Brixham section, which is all built over, um, and the pavements and the walkways and the roads, because we want to put um, route markers all the way from the station site just over here, uh, right the way through to North Boundary Road and then beyond to Churston as well. So there is a route that people can follow that we'll look at in just a moment. And also, also from the bridges point of view, so there are seven bridges remaining today of the original eight. Now, if you discount Churston Bridge, because of course that was replaced, I think, in the 70s, correct me if I'm wrong, um, we used to have the old really hazardous stone bridge that used to be loads of road traffic accidents on. They've replaced that with the one that's there today. The only bridge that completely disappeared is the bridge at Northfields Lane. All of the other bridges, six other original bridges, are still intact, are, in, are along the line today. So more about that later. Uh, but they are managed and annually inspected by the Historical Railways Estate on behalf of the Department for Transport uh, and the Highways England, and they get Balfour BT to inspect those every single year, and we have copies of those inspection reports, so we know exactly the conditions of those bridges and what work, ne and work, what work needs to be done to make sure that they are maintained and, and, and well kept. So, and then, of course, there are multiple um, private residences that are built over the line, and uh, we've been talking to some of those people as well. Um, con community engagement and uh, the response, so th this is Carlton and I at the uh, Torbay Steam Fair in the summer, and we had over 100 people come and sort of register with us uh, for more information, to sign up to our newsletter, and also to, um, yeah, become a volunteer to help us with the clearing of the line and things like that. So um, and those people are from primarily, primarily Brixham, but also from Churston and Gampton as well. So it is a real sort of community response that we've had. Uh, incredible, as I say. Also, um, you probably are um, aware of uh, local MP Tony Man Anthony Manknell, um, as well as other councillors and businessmen uh, who are very supportive, supportive of what we're doing. So, uh, and Anthony is very keen to come with me and walk along the line just as soon as we can. So, um, lots of encouragement there. So the route of the trail, so do um, accept my apologies for the rather Blue Peter style map here, but uh, you can see it's a Google Earth map. And what I've done is just created in purple the pretty much the original line that went from Brixham Station, just over here, all the way through to North Boundary Road, which is what we're calling section one. Now that entire section actually uh, is a little bit in and out of the houses, uh, sort of, so to speak. So um, we'll go through it more in just a moment, but um, it is impossible to walk the line as it was back in the 1960s when it closed. Um, but we, cut, that we get fairly close to it. So the red line that you see on there is one of the, one of the two proposed routes that you can walk from the station site right the way through to North Boundary Road, weaving in and out of the houses and the various different areas along the way. Um, the light blue line that you see there is one of the alternative routes that we're looking at because when you get to the bridge that is no longer there on North Fields Lane, there's a couple of different options that you can take. So one is going along past the old oil depot at the bottom of the V and then along to the industrial park and through um, back over to the purple line or the red line is more sort of weaving in and out of the houses. So the start of the trail naturally starts in Brixham just over here, 
Now, one of the original thoughts that we had is uh, to acquire the toilet block just here, right opposite the old Brixham Railway Station. Um, we haven't been successful with our bid to take that. However, the good news is whoever will take it on has been asked to work with us to help us provide um, some kind of um, yeah, support with what we're doing, whether it be an information board, a map, an area to put information on and things like that. Um, so you would start here, regardless of you know, the, the toilet block, um, and then, as I say, that's literally right opposite the station site on Rope Walk Hill. So as you continue down Rope Walk Hill, if you imagine walking down the hill towards the harbour, um, you have uh, the actual entrance into the old railway site there, so that's um, Rope Walk Hill. Uh, used to be uh, Fish Lane, I think it was, Pauline, something like that. Um, but then you go into Harbour View Close, which basically all of those houses on Far Harbour View Close are where the train station and the rail head and all that uh, used to be. So a couple of thoughts. Uh, you may be aware of Mrs. Murals, who's done some wonderful murals in Brixham, uh, above the Rio Fish Cafe, and uh, more recently above Hans gifts so we thought well in fact we didn't think one of the residences one of the residents from up on the estate there said wouldn't it be nice to have a mural of the railway or an image of the railway um painted on on the side of on the side of some of the houses so we thought that's a good idea so i got in contact with uh, mrs murals ellie and um she's given us some some ideas just to work with at the moment and we think actually looking at those they look very attractive so um Let's see where that goes. I mean, we've got loads of ideas for loads of murals all the way along the route, but we need to just, uh, you know, take it one at a time. So uh, as you come down onto the corner, we thought maybe you could come across and take a look back up to the um, to where the fish truck fell over the edge um, all those years ago, and uh, you get a good view from there looking up at the station. Um, and there's a, an old picture just to sort of see how it was before that as well. Um, you would then turn into what is North Furzham Road. And we'll have some information boards along the route here, of course. Um, what's interesting about that retaining wall, actually, is that um, it wasn't actually that high when the railway was actually in existence. You can see, if you look closer during the daylight, not necessarily in that picture, there is a second layer of almost very similar or exact stone, but it's a different um, type of stone that they've built up to raise that uh, walkway that loops around the edge. So then you carry on up South Fersham Road, and you have the little... Um, uh, Signalman's Cottage there, which may or may not have housed uh, some of the railway workers. We're still trying to establish if that actually did. You carry on a little bit more, and what do you see? The ramp that goes up to the old station site, and the handrail is some old track. So there's all these little clues, and every time I walk the actual trail, uh, the proposed trail, I find different things. It's really fascinating. So um, you can see where the station was up the top there on the left-hand side, and then the little uh, walkway that goes up. You carry on and you come to the Queen's Arms, originally called the Queen's Hotel, of course, um, and that opened just about a year after the railway station itself opened up. And of course, you've got the famous bridge that most people don't really think anything about as they're driving through it each day, but it's there and it's a relic of the, um, of the railway. So what I just wanted to highlight with these pictures here, actually, is something else I just noticed recently was the, uh, the little extra bit of wall that was built up on um, I want to get this to work. Yeah, so you can see that was the old bridge as it was back in the day with this initial, with this additional, um, I guess it was steel, Actually, yeah. yeah, section on here. This is the bridge today, but you can notice actually that there's a, a stone wall that's been built along the top there. I'm guessing for safety, yeah. um, which didn't, which wasn't originally along the bridge when uh, when the when the railway line closed. So. Every time I go up there, I just see these new things. Um, let me see what that's all about. Not now, thank you very much. So, yeah, we carry on then along South Furzham Road. And one of the stories that uh, I was told by somebody that contacted me just a few months ago was about the signalman that worked in the signal station just there. So some of them used to live um, on South Furzham Road. And in order to get to the signal box every day, they had to go through the station compound, into the main entrance, walk along the track, and then into their signal box, which they found a bit onerous. So what they decided to do was to remove some of the stone from the wall. And you can see just here, it's been uh, cemented up now uh, with, with mortar, but they pulled out some of the stones to create some footholds so they could just 
climb up the wall over the top and into the signal box. Why walk all the way around when you can just do that? So I thought that was a, one of the many, many stories. And of course, that's the signal box there. And this is the site of the signal box, which is just uh, down there. Um, so again, we would put a, um, an information board or such like there, just telling a little story about the signal box, when it opened, when it closed, and things like that. And the actual initial, or the original signal box nameplate, name board, is at Didcot Railway Centre, the original board. And we are trying to get them to loan us that, but it's proving quite difficult at the moment. So we might just have to make a replica, a replica copy. So carrying on, um, I think some of you in the room might live in some of these houses along South Thurston Road. Um, so it's just pointing out that's where the railway line went through the gardens of these houses. And on the other side, there is still some of the original fence um, and the fence posts that were there at the time of the railway that were put there for the railway. Opposite, you've got Furzham House, which is where uh, some of the railway workers actually lived as well, and also uh, one of the station masters from 1888, I believe, was uh, also living in that house. And when I went to knock on the door, because I'm knocking on everybody's doors at the moment, trying to find out lots of information, um, and uh, inside that house is actually a huge water tank that they put in place a number of years ago, and the framework for the water tank is actually rail. So there's bits of rail everywhere. So next up we come to, um, so you're going to go along um, South Furzham Road, and that's one of two possible routes that you can take. So you'll go along South Furzham Road, the original one, and then you'll cut to the right uh, and go along Vicarage Hill, and then past the old railway gardens. So uh, yes, Brixham created this uh, lovely little railway gardens um, just at the end of um, the new South Furzham Road, which is built along the old railway line and Sun Valley Close. So um, that's another little feature just to point out along the route. And then as you go a little bit further along, you have the old Occupation Bridge. So not many people knew it even existed, uh, let alone that it was there. So um, up until recently, that was fairly overgrown. And um, it's been cut back to reveal the lovely stonework and the bridge that's there. And we thought, well, it'd be great, obviously, to have that highlighted as one of the points of interest along the route. So what we thought, Mrs. Murals, maybe you could um, paint um, a mural on the, con on the sort of, it's a block, breeze block wall that's covering up um, the actual bridge there because the other side of the bridge is somebody's private garden. So we thought we could have a nice mural there, a couple of benches, Great Western Railway themed benches, a little bird box to encourage wildlife birds, um, and some flowers and just make that a nice area where the locals can actually come along and uh, speak to each other and enjoy the sunshine perhaps. So carrying on along uh, that section, you then come up to um, the walkway that leads from the bridge along by South um, Sun Valley Close, and it then goes along uh, to Cumberland Drive, uh, sorry, to Cumberland Green and then Cumber Drive. So there's a couple of different options that you can take because you can't walk along the old line because they've built a series of houses or bungalows right over the line there, unfortunately, but you can get quite close to it. Uh, then you come on to North Fields Lane. So this is where the bridge used to be, and it pretty much was going across at an angle like that. Of course, there's nothing left of it whatsoever. And uh, again, one of the little stories that somebody told me about was that um, back in the day, as vehicles were getting bigger and bigger, the trains went over the top of the bridge, traffic went underneath the bridge, but as vi vi vehicles were getting higher, uh, they couldn't get under the bridge. So what they did was they lowered the road, but by doing that, it then flooded regularly when it rained, as you can imagine. So uh, obviously in the end, they removed that um, as well. So again, we'd have an information board there. Between that section uh, of North Fields Lane and North Boundary Road, it's quite higgledy-piggledy with, with where you have to walk to get to this point. So I'm not going to sort of put too much detail up about that at the moment. But eventually you come to North Boundary Road. And North Boundary Road, you have this lovely little play park. And I can promise you, you will never see anybody in there, especially not kids. All the bungalows and, and properties around that area are people that are retired, um, you know, the elderly, people that don't have kids. So um, we have a proposal for the council for this area here um, to acquire it and to take uh, responsibility for it, create a railway gardens uh, with some benches and make it a nice space for the local people, the retired folk mostly, to come along and, and enjoy. And of course, it will be the start of the next section. Um, so the next section is, as you can see, from North Boundary Road just here, all the way through, so this is sections two through to six, to Churston Station just here. So um, we've got a section there across the fields of the prairie, as um, 
which I mentioned earlier, the little section between Copythorne Road Bridge and Churston Village, and then the larger section over to Elbury, and then through to Bridge Road, and then through to um, Churston. So what do you see when you climb over the fence, which is what I did, um, of the little play park at North Boundary Lane? And I did get permission from the Churston Barony agents, just so you know, I didn't go trespassing. Um, so that's what greets you at the other side of the North Boundary Road uh, play park. When you go over, it's the cutting, and as you can see, it's pretty dense. Um, nothing much down there apart from the dense vegetation. So that uh, we would potentially ramp that down from the play park, come railway gardens down into the cutting and then initially for the walk walking route you would uh we would just create just enough space we don't need to clear the whole thing just enough space to uh walk through um that part you can see as you progress it, it's there are clearer parts oops sorry there are clearer parts um which you can quite easily walk through um with just very minimal clearing but then you do come back onto areas where you can't walk through because it's so dense again um and then you come, back, uh, come over to the Humpback Bridge. So uh, along that part of the track, uh, section two, uh, uh, where you come into uh, the end here at Copythorne Road Bridge, as, as we we'll call it for this presentation, um, it is uh, an area where some farm traffic does move around at certain times of the year. So we're working with the farm, with the estate, to see how best to manage that. And it might be that we have to close sec sections of the, um, the walkway during particular times of the year when there's lots of farming activity going on but you know we'll have that ability to do that to manage it safely but we will see uh, as we progress along the project how that will be actually managed so so the next section here is is you're coming on to section three at the Copythorne Road Bridge or the Humpback Bridge as everybody sort of goes over it but doesn't think much about it underneath is where the trains used to go through and um, we're hoping at some point in the future that that can be cleared out that's one of the challenges is clearing out what's under that bridge um, and then you come on to the section on the right, which is just a very small uh, embankment to get you across to um, Churston Village. So you come through this section here, and you can see, not too, not too grown up, considering that's 60 years of growth, um, it's, not too, it's, it's not even knee deep in that section. So relatively straightforward to clear that section. And then you come on to Churston uh, Village Bridge, and this is the top of the bridge. There's a little bit of, um, of the stonework that needs some attention, should we say, but we're working with um, the relevant uh, key stakeholders to, to sort of look at that. Um, carrying on then, so we're now moving on to section uh, four, which is between Churston Village and Elbury Lane. So you can see there, not too bad at all, just to sort of access there. Obviously on the sides of the bridge, we would put some fencing so nobody falls off, um, but you get some fantastic views and I haven't got them here really, but you can look over to the bay and when you're on the top there and you get a completely different perspective because you're about five or six metres above road level and you don't often get to see that. Uh, unless you go up on the top there, you're looking over the farm, the fields, you can see the golf course in the distance, and of course Tor Bay, because you're that much higher up. So it's a great and different perspective to enjoy. Uh, and when people go to walk along there, I'm sure it'll be absolutely fantastic. So carrying on here, we're sort of heading towards Elbury Lane, and then we get to Elbury Lane. And of course, as John had mentioned earlier, uh, there was a bridge section there previously, but the bridge deck uh, unfortunately was removed. I don't know why, I don't know when, somebody in the room might know. But um, it was removed, so you sort of come to a section there that we will need to look at rebridging at some point. That's one of the engineering challenges that we've highlighted in our, um, in our report. So that section there at the moment, we're looking at ways of how you can come down the side of the, um, the bridge to then cross over the lane, to then go back up the other side um, until such time we can replace the bridge section. So that's slightly longer term. Uh, and then section five is from Elbury Lane Bridge through to Bridge Road Bridge. So as you're going over Elbury Lane, you then start to go down into the railway cutting. Having gone along the, cut, the actual embankment, you start to sort of go down. And you can see here, um, you actually go down about five metres overall into the railway cutting. That's what you see as you go through there. Again, considering 60 years of growth, uh, since almost 60 years of growth, um, they took the track bed up. There's still some of the... Um, limestone ballast in, in sections here and I've got a piece actually there which I which I took <laughs> um, so yeah so relatively minimal clearing along this section of the route as you head towards Bridge Road in the cutting that's me and the team um, you can see the sort of the depth from the field 
on the top there down to the base. And then of course you approach bridge, road bridge, which is here. And obviously you can't go through the bridge because you come into a private garden, uh, Churston House. Uh, but we would be looking to come up here to the side and then you would carry on. So you come out over the side here, potentially, We're looking to see what we can do with this, um, onto the bridge and then through uh, a long bridge road. So <clears throat> I know you've seen these pictures before, uh, but Sue, who used to live in the house there, welcomed me into her house to take pictures of, of her garden. And she showed me this great image of uh, her in, the, uh, I think it was 1973, yeah. Um, which is great. That's now all, f all forms part of her garden, which is, which is now here, and that's the bridge. Uh, this is some more images of the house that she let me have. Um, so you can see at some point it was a, um, there was a stop here, so they probably just ran the train around for a little while um, until they then filled it in just here. So you can see all this from, um, we'll have an information board or such like just on the bridge here, so you can sort of read a bit more about that section there. So then uh, how do you get from Bridge Road Bridge to Churston? Well, of course, that section is actually built over, um, and you'll see the pictures in a minute. What we're proposing is that you probably, from Bridge Road Bridge here, walk down towards Churston, or potentially, uh, because there's no pavement there, you could walk through the southwest water um, field area here, and then you come out on the other side. Um, this is what you see as you're going down Bridge Road, so nothing spectacular other than these houses are built over the, uh, the old railway line that curved around in the pictures that you saw earlier um, towards the Brixham branch. Uh, at the top end of Bridge Road, you then come up here uh, and down the underpass, you get a great view. So we would potentially put an information board here looking out over to the, uh, the current railway area here uh, with images of how it used to be and plans and things like that. So uh, and then that's just looking the other way towards Churston. This is an underbridge, so you can guess what I'm thinking we could potentially do with these walls. <laughs> this is murals. <laughs> um, now, you know, I think that would brighten that up tremendously if we had some lovely murals um, painted on there, but we'd have to get them coated with some kind of anti-vandal um, uh, covering or something like that, I think. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, you, you, you can get a great view from the top of the, the road bridge, uh, so the, new, the replacement bridge over Churston Station, um, and again, potentially have an information board there showing a plan, a map, some photos, and some content of what, uh, what used to be. So, um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much where you end up. So that's the station in Cherson just there. That's the board that's still there on the other side of the station. Um, and then perhaps you could pop into the railway in for a pint afterwards. So that's, that's the general idea. Uh, <laughs> um, and that, that one there is obviously showing a nice image that we could put on the bridge there to show how the trains used to go off to Brixham. Uh, there are lots of points of interest. I'm not going to list them all out. We don't have time. But there are lots of points of interest all the way along the railway trail. Right the way from Brixham here with the station site, um, obviously the bridges, the, si the site of the signal box just over here. You've also got the... Um, <coughs> excuse me. You've also got the, uh, the fact that you've got the, the occupation bridge uh, where we're going to put the mural on. Um, the cuttings, the embankments, lots of different points of interest all the way along. But we also, as you get into the sort of nature part of the trail, we want to bring to life some of the wildlife, some of the flora, fauna, wildlife that you might see down there as you're walking through there as well. So um, lots of points of interest along the way. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, what we're looking to do. In sections, the original thought, and you, you'll, you'll read it on the flyer, um, was that we can get all, the, all of that done by May of next year, ready for the anniversary uh, of the closure. Um, I think we were being a bit optimistic, to be honest, and obviously with the current challenges globally, um, and financially, economically, and everything else, um, not to mention time, um, that's going to be a struggle. So what the, we're sort of reassessing what we could achieve in the time frame now between May, between now and May, to see what we can achieve. If that, with agreement from the Church and Barony and the various uh, landowners and key stakeholders, if we can achieve a section or two, that would be great. The first section, we would like to think would be quite straightforward, working with Torbay Council and their partners to sort of put information boards in at key areas um, and route markers and things like that. That would be really good. So, um, or even just an information board on the site, you know, anything just to mark something for the anniversary. Uh, and then obviously the project can be a slightly longer term one if it needs to be. So um, some of the items from the railway, uh, we are going out, we're asking people to come forward with any items that they might have. We've been researching, we found this, um, 
little key um, that was uh, at Swindon. Yeah, is it Swindon currently? Swindon, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and, and there's a signal box sign at uh, Didcot. Um, people must have um, souvenirs that they must have taken from the station when it closed. Uh, we know they do. There are signs and things all over the place. So um, we're hoping to bring, as I mentioned, uh, bring together, as I mentioned earlier, all of these bits and pieces for a new exhibition in Brixham Museum. Um, and, you know, there are sign boards. There, uh, you know, these here are all on the platform of the station. There would be um, lamps under the station canopies. Somebody's taken those. And we know people have got them because um, if you look at pictures before closure and then after, obviously before closure, they're all there. And then... A short time after the station closed, the station's still there, but all the signs are gone, all the lamps are gone, all the benches are gone. Um, so they're all out there somewhere. Um, porters' trolleys, poster frames, bench seats. Um, and these are some things that we really want to get hold of, the station or the signal box logs and record books. Apparently they used to be kept in the roof spaces or the lofts of the stations. Um, and then if enthusiasts were to you know, find out that the uh, stations were about to be demolished, they go in there, help themselves, and you know they'd be gone forevermore. Um, but we know that there must be people out there <clears throat> with some of these items, so we would encourage people to come forward to loan, donate um, for the new exhibition. So uh, some of the hurdles that we've tackled um, that we've had, we've uh, you know there's the missing bridge deck at Elbury Lane Bridge. So we have um, James Nightingale is one of our project team. He's an ex-railway engineer, so he's been looking at options for a bridge plate um, that we can put in there, and there are lots of options out there. So that could be relatively straightforward in regards to bridging that. Land ownership, so you know we are talking to the various landowners. Um, some of them are a little bit hot and cold at times, so it's just persisting with getting through those uh, discussions. Um, support for the project, you know, uh, you know, we weren't sure initially are people going to be on our side? Are people going to be interested in this? Well, look at the room. Um, I think that says it all. And then um, the sections of the, uh, the tracks, like the uh, infield cuttings and the bridge uh, at Copythorne Roads Bridge, um, there's quite a big job there to clear out everything that's been piled in underneath. Um, but again, you know, we're talking to the landowners about that. Um, and one of the biggest challenges for myself is resources and time. Um, because this isn't my full-time job, this is kind of a hobby on the side, and um, uh, it's a great hobby, a great interest that we have, but uh, it does take up quite a lot of time, so uh, that is a challenge as well. Risks to the project, so there are some risks, um, not least we learned recently uh, that the Church and Barony are potentially looking to sell off this, uh, these fields here alongside Copythorne Road for, I'm not sure if it's 98 houses or 198 houses. Um, and this is some of the content that they've provided about, you know, why there should be houses built in that area. Initially, when I heard about that, I thought, oh, no, I hope they haven't put the plans in to build over the railway line, because that would just, you know, absolutely knock the stuffing out of the project. But fortunately, <clears throat> it's not, but it, it, it's there. Um, resources, as we've said, uh, funding. So, you know, we are looking at lots of different funding options and sponsorship and donations and grants and things like that, um, all of which are kind of in process to a point. Um, landowners change of agent manager so with the barony their agents they've just had a management change so the guy that we were dealing with there very very helpful initially letting us go on the site whenever we needed to to do our reviews and our site inspections it, that's now changed and the guy that's there now is perhaps not quite so um, yeah helpful but you know we, we're working on that we, we've got a meeting coming up with him soon um, and then, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the national global climate that we live in at the moment with the p politics, the financial issues, environmental and economic challenges that, that lie there, which will affect potentially funding and resources and, and lots of other things as well. Um, so we are hoping to secure some local funding um, through council, government, etc., etc. We are also looking at donations. We are looking at sponsorship. Um, there are lots of areas of sponsorship that we can tap into. We have relations with the fishing industry. If you think about it, how, many, how much fish went out by rail from Brixham, so there's a link there to tap into the fishing industry. Uh, solicitors, we'll be talking to some of the solicitors. Richard Walston was a solicitor, uh, and various others as well. Now, we've counted up along the entire route from Brixham to Churston, there's about potentially 32 points of interest, so that means potentially 32 information boards that we would like to install. Um, and, of course, they cost. Now, we have one of our... Uh, supporters and, and sponsors um, who is happy to help us with the design work and things like that. The actual um, information boards themselves, we were thinking, well, we could get businesses to sponsor a board. Um, 
or boards. So we would be looking for businesses to come forward and we would be putting a sponsorship package together uh, for businesses to have their, their logo on each information board, board to, uh, to help us uh, you know, deliver this project. So um, <clears throat> that was that. Other parts of the story. So yeah, over and above the actual main story of the railway, um, and John mentioned this earlier, but Parkham Wood, where Richard uh, Wollstone used to live, uh, or Parkham House, that uh, is now Saxon Heights, of course. So there's a blue plaque up there, which is quite interesting. Uh, nearby Tinker's Wood, and these all are areas where the water pumps and the, um, the mills were to help funnel the water up, uh, up here. Um, Torbay and Brixham Railway Office HQ, as far as we can find, find out, uh, is on New Road, just at the bottom of the hill that, that comes out from Saxon Heights, uh, which is now Brewers, the decorators. So that's where, as far as we understand, where Richard Wollstone's HQ was for the uh, Torbay and Brixham Railway. Blue plaque, potentially. Pump house on Glenmore Road, so you might not know, but the actual pump house that used to pump the water from um, Parkham Wood and Tinker's Wood through the town, under the road, and up to Parkham, uh, up to Furzham, sorry, was on Glenmore Road. Um, and of course, all the railway, house, railway workers' houses. We wanted to find out who lived where, and we've, we're quite a long way along the line with that. Pauline's doing some great research, so we know where many of the workers actually lived. And of course, we like to work with the Torbay Society, Historical Society, to, to put blue plaques and things like that on those houses, just to highlight them, you know. Oh, and there's one there. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so we've talked a little bit about items of interest, but if anyone does have any items of interest, you know, please, please, you know, come forward. All these kind of items we're looking at. Um, I believe we've got the grandson of um, uh, John Dilly here this evening. Are you here at the back there? Yeah, yeah, welcome. So uh, this lovely little book here, that's that one there, is a great little read if you want a quick, a quick history of the Brixham Branch Line. Um, you can get it on eBay. Great little book. It's great to have you with us. Um, otherwise, of course... There's the Bricks and Branch by Chris Potts. Now, we have found out lots of different things over and above what's in this book. The book is 20 years old, but it's a great start if you want to know more about the Bricks and Railway. And we've got, sale, we've got them for sale over in our little mini shop over there as well. So, um, this is a, a very important piece of what we're doing. We're very much aware that as you walk through the old railway track bed, <clears throat> it's basically a forest. Much of it looks like that, and so uh, there will be potentially all sorts living in amongst that. There might be some rare flowers and plant life and all that kind of thing there. We will be undertaking a full environmental study um, before we start sort of, you know, cutting back anything there. Um, but we are very uh, responsible with what we do. We've got it all in the plan as to how we're going to tackle that, um, not least by just making sure that we do the right thing and, and make sure we're looking out for, <coughs> excuse me, various... Uh, things that we should look out for. So, um, and we also want to combine the heritage trail with the nature trail. So like I said before, it's not just about the historical elements. It's about as you walk through this quite dense area, um, you know, it's a fascinating and it's a lovely walk. You'll hear, hear the birds in the canopy of the trees and you'll hear uh, other, other wildlife rough, rustling around as well. So, um, and again, we'll put sort of rest points along the way and information boards about the flora, fauna, wildlife and all that kind of thing as well. Um, so we have core, uh, five core values as well. So that's environment, sustainability, for example, the information boards that we'll put in and the benches will all be from uh, sustainable or, or um, um, re... Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, um, all reusable things, all recycled bits and pieces. Recycled, that's the word, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and yeah, we want to make sure we engage with community at every step of the way health and fitness and well-being, so by walking through those, um, the, the trail, not only are you finding, you know, getting fit, obviously, but you're also finding out information about history and nature, uh, so that's good for your well-being, um, and history and heritage as well, so we want to work with schools. I've already done a presentation to St. Margaret Clitheroe, and the kids loved it, and um, yeah, you know, the, the, the school here at Furzham are very keen to work with us in educating the kids about the history of the line as well. And actually, they've seen some of the amazing pictures that we've been sort of showing throughout the evening as well that they haven't seen before, because that's another thing that we're putting together that will be shared on our, light, on our website is a photo library with all the pictures that we could possibly find, um, taken by official photographers, but also by amateur photographers, personal photographs as well, like the one you saw with the lady in the railway cutting, Sue. Um, yeah, so uh, the next steps really are just following up, continuing our dialogue with the landowners. Um, we're looking to take on the responsibility of the, of the, of the 
of the track bed, source more funding, design uh, the information boards, apply for planning permission to start installing the infrastructure, like the information boards, um, create a charity status for the project as well, and also uh, mobilize the team of volunteers. Now with that, the response we've had from volunteers um, over the past six months or so has been tremendous. We've got nearly 100 people that have said, yeah, we'll help you cut back the railway trail. You know, whenever you're ready to engage uh, to start the project, we'll be ready to, uh, to help cut it back and to, to develop it. So it's really a community project that we're looking to do. Um, and and the, as I say, the response has been tremendous. So um, the picture you can see there um, is from the system, 1964 film. I thought I'd just throw that in there. And um, yeah, that kind of concludes the project. Uh, Sort of review, really, I suppose. I could probably go on for quite a bit longer, but I'm conscious of time. Lots more to tell, but we are sort of just giving you a bit of an idea of what, what the plan is and what the route is and things like that. Do visit our website at brixtonrailwaytrail.org.uk. You can email us there as well. Um, find us on Facebook, of course, and there are various videos and photos that you can enjoy on our Facebook, uh, sorry, on our YouTube channel as well. So that is kind of it for now. Um, so we're just going to do a very quick Q and A. Uh, if I can ask the, the team to come up to the front, project team. Um, yeah. So if, does anyone have any questions uh, about anything that we've talked about this evening? Really, and there will be things that we've not thought about. So please do feel free to volunteer any ideas um, and ask any more questions. Yeah. Yeah. So that, yeah. I didn't quite understand who does that belong to. Are you available to, to, uh, to get that? Because that would make a very good sort of visitor centre. Yeah, that, that was the idea. Uh, so as you probably know, it's been vacant, empty for many, many years, probably 25 years, 30 years maybe. Um, so we, we kind of saw that and we thought, that would be good. Right opposite the station entrance, possible visitor information. Um, we had a look at it. We, we put in our tender for it. We sort of realised it was going to cost about twenty or thousand pounds just to make it half decent, but it was going to be a visitor centre, a coffee bar, and other things as well. Um, but unfortunately, our proposal didn't quite make the last uh, two. However, the last two businesses that have made it um, have been asked to submit their thoughts and ideas about how they can accommodate um, the project in some way. So that might be an official starting point with a map with some information on it. So. Um, Actually, that might suit us better anyway, rather than having to spend 20 odd thousand pounds on, on making it a so decent visitor centre. not going to knock it down or anything? I, I don't know. Um, I don't know the plans for the last two businesses that have been successful to make it to the last two. Um, but what I do know from the councillors that we've been talking to is that they uh, have been asked to say, how can you accommodate in some way this Brixham yeah. Heritage Trail? So, yeah, so that's, that's positive. Okay, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, John. Is your idea to basically take each section in a turn, or did you want to be trying to approach the whole <coughs> length all at the same time? Which I wouldn't have thought you did. No. <laughs> so initially, and, and you know, a little bit, um, we were got a bit carried away. Maybe we thought, yeah, we could open this whole trail um, before May, before the anniversary. Yeah. Sixty years since the closure of the line, but now we're opening up the line again for people to enjoy so um, that's not going to happen obviously <laughs> so now we are looking at it in bite-sized chunks and that's why I broke it down into six sections um, and we will aim to complete as many sections as we can but one at a time completing um, before May if we can but then it will be an ongoing um, project yeah yeah okay yes sir. Uh, are you, um, you going to make it dog friendly I'm, I'm conscious of going across farm now yeah, it's it's so we've been asked a, a few things. You know, is it accessible for wheelchairs? Will it be dog friendly? Uh, will it be cycle friendly? And all these kind of things. Um, so, I think initially, we just have to tread very carefully with the landowners, and we don't want to sort of spook them by saying, "Yeah, there'll be dogs allowed to go along the walkway." Of course, the public would love dog walkers would obviously love to have that. Um, I'm not saying no that that won't happen initially or even eventually, but uh, we just need to take into account the farm, the farm life, you know, the animals on the farm and things like that. Um, of course, we will be containing walkers 
within the track bed along the route. Um, but of course, that doesn't guarantee the fact that if a dog is let off a leash or a lead, it can then jump over and scare the sheep and all that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, these are things that are under review, but I would we're trying to play it very, very carefully so we can get the first stage and then the following stages will come about after that. So, um, yeah, not saying no for sure at the first stage, but we'll just have to play that by ear. But it's something that's on our list. Yeah. Again, yeah. Uh, it's not a question. It's just a suggestion. Okay. Um, BRNC are, are always looking for community projects. Okay. Um, they like a specific project that will last maybe one or two or three days. Um, if I ping you over the uh, First Lieutenant Secretary's telephone number, you can ring up and ask. Yeah, great. Okay. But if you get your, if you, you know, I can't obviously commit the college. I have nothing to do with it. But I have used them myself. <coughs> if you um, get your name in the system, when they get people, they will come to you and say, hey, yeah. we're looking at a date. Do you have something to do? Okay, brilliant. Thank and you. Yeah. very good at cutting down... Down, Careful what you say. Uh, <laughs> Good. We have uh, George Coles, one of the project team that's just joined us recently, actually, uh, is uh, quite an expert, I think, in sourcing funding and, and signing up to these kind of things as well. So George is going to help us along the line with that. So, yeah, but do share that information with me and we can talk about that internally. Thanks. Yeah, sir. Yes. Um, <clears throat> when you start cutting away and giving your way through the bridges and round and over and under, would that mean at some time, not perhaps immediately, that to take all reliability of those said bridges because if you do that is quite a cost and ongoing and many thousands have been taken down because they just can't afford to to give the upkeep with them now you know so yeah so liability of, of using the bridges can um, I fill that one, yeah can you go for that one as, as far as we know the, all the bridges are vested in the department of transport mm -hmm. and i think the way to actually address that is to push the department of transport to keep the bridges safe so the cost of the project becomes minimal. So rather than us doing works to affect the structures, we so work with the work DOT. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's right. Because you're quite right, you don't want to start taking on those sorts of liabilities. No, because suddenly, you know, that's through the post saying, hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's done a good job, but... Um, <clears throat> yeah. That's one of the things that we're looking at with the... Um, the, the, the land owner, land owners, the barony, the Churston barony with the estate there, so is it's liability. So we're, we've submitted to them what we think we want to do in regards to liability on there, taking it on. Um, so that's just going through the solicitors and all that kind of stuff at the moment. So you just have to think of everything. You do, you do, yeah. Um, any more questions before we wrap up, folks? Yeah. Yes. Go, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> yeah. we've, we've done a basic survey so far. Uh, I don't know, the, the sharp eyed of you may have noticed that at Elbury Lane, there was a handrail down the wing wall of the bridge, which may have coincided with where the chap used to get off for his farm. Uh, that mm. handrail is still there. Mm. So we're looking at putting accesses, that traditionally they, they were at bridges anyway, for railway workers to access the railway. That's exactly what we would do. We look to put them at the bridges, mainly. But what we have to be careful of is where they actually come out onto the main roads. Because, of course, you get people coming straight off a footpath. You don't want them going straight in front of traffic. So they all have to be carefully constructed. But we have started a good look at that. Good. OK, well, we'll take one more. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so the initial plan really is to clear it carefully. So we're not just going to go in there and start clearing it. We're going to undertake environmental surveys using professionals to support us with that because we need to see what's there. You know, we have walked it, to be fair, we haven't seen anything apart from hearing a few birds in the canopy. Um, so we haven't actually seen any wildlife in the cutting or, or certainly not on the embankments and things like that. So, 
Yeah, so, so the survey will establish what's there, uh, not only wildlife but plant life as well. So uh, we need to know what, what is there. Uh, in regards to enriching it, then you know, we would look at bird boxes, we would look at um, other things to sort of see how we can do that. Yeah, we, we would look at planting as well, and we talked about the railway garden that we want to create on North Boundary, North Boundary Road, and things like that. So yeah, so we want to make sure we do things properly, um, protecting the environment and the wildlife, rather than you know, the other way around. So, um, okay, folks, so we're gonna finish it there. Just one more quick thing to do. So Tony Brooks, uh, who's from the Torbay Steam Fair, was going to come along tonight and present us with a check um, to go towards the, um, the project, which was, is fantastic. Unfortunately, Tony's not able to come along tonight, so he has a uh, second lieutenant there to help us and uh, present a check as well. So um, I think, yeah, so Les, thank you. Yes, okay, well, I'm presenting it from one society which I used to belong to, which was the uh, Steam Fair, to this society now, which I am now a member of. So Tony thought that as I'm still an honorary member of the Steam Fair, I was the best person for him to give the, the check to. Uh, the Steam Fair are donating initially 150 pounds to our cause. Excellent, thank so, you very much. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Tony, uh, could not be with us or did not wish to be with us uh, for the fear of spreading uh, some uh, unknown disease but uh, he said would I no do this in his absence and uh, luckily we're very pleased that they are uh, more than willing to work along with us they're delighted with what we're doing and uh, he's hoping that the two uh, will complement each other you know, Absolutely, the, the yeah. Fair, yeah. And uh, as I say, they're very much in favour of what we're doing, and this is their first effort. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Les, and thank you to the Torbay Steam Fair. Tony was even talking about bringing one of the old uh, bricks and whippets, one of the old engines down here next year if we're ready to accommodate yeah. it. So, uh, so that's and brilliant. That, and that yeah. is going to happen because, as you've probably seen, we, it, we have done it before on a couple of occasions, bringing real engines from Buckfast Lee to the steam rally and uh, Tony's working himself on 1420, one of the uh, 1400 class that used to work on the Brixton line and as soon as it's ready, um, he said it would be a pleasure to put it on a lorry, bring it down and have it here uh, somewhere along the line to coincide with the opening of one of our sections uh, for you yeah. all to see. So, uh, so thank you Tony and thank you Les, yeah. thank you very much. Um, just on the... the <laughs> A couple of quick things before you all go. Uh, so, talking to the Steam Fair, just so you know, next year it's between the 4th and the 6th of August, um, in the usual place, I believe. Um, yeah, if anybody wants to sort of sign up to our newsletter to become a volunteer, please see Carlton at the desk at the front. We also have the little shop there. All, all proceeds go to the project. And finally, thank you very much for coming along this evening. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everybody.